Thank you, Donna. Thank you, Samuels. It's such an encouragement to see father and daughter worshiping our Lord together like that, isn't it? Uh, We talked a few weeks ago about God's design for the family and that it be an atmosphere that nurtures discipleship and what a wonderful picture that that is for us. Uh, Children are dismissed in the minutes that we have remaining for this morning's message and um, it's already been a full morning of worship and we look forward to our afternoon of fellowship together as well. Uh, Odds were against us this year uh, with the weather, but it seems that it's holding, and so please keep that in your prayers, and that is a wonderful time, and as has already been communicated to you, uh, we invite you to come. If you're visiting with us, we'll especially be offended if you don't join us for a a quick bite, and uh, we want to get to know you, so I just want to give you that personal invitation as well, and we want to show hospitality to you in any way that we can, but certainly the pinnacle point of our every week comes to this point right here, when we come together around the pulpit ministry of our church to hear the Word of God proclaimed, when we look to the Word of God and grow together in grace and love and fellowship with one another and our Lord. And so if you haven't already done so, I invite you to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 5, and we are now in verses 17 to 25. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 17 to to 25, and as you do that, I would like to remind you a little bit of the context that we're dealing with in the church in Ephesus. The church in Ephesus began all the way back in Acts chapter 18, and Paul briefly evangelized there in the city, and uh, right from the beginning, Ephesus had a strong and promising future as a mature body of Christ, as the light in a dark world. Roman world. It had um, such a beginning that any one of the early New Testament churches would have rejoiced to have been blessed such as they were, as I mentioned, planted by the Apostle Paul. It had exemplary, self-sacrificial deacons and deaconesses in their church, among whom were Aquila and Priscilla, whom you know. And they were marked by a spirit of humility and were nothing less than a blessing to the leadership there. During its early formative years in infancy, its preacher was perhaps one of the most eloquent preachers in the world. Named Apollos. Acts chapter 18 describes his preaching as fervent, greatly powerful, bold, thorough, and accurate, certainly everything that a faithful expositor would want to be, everything that he would aspire to be. And when Paul returned there for a second time on his third missionary journey, he stayed with them for three and a half years, and that was incredible dedication on his part. And we even read that, that Paul held absolutely nothing from them, nothing biblically, nothing theologically, Uh, He held nothing from them, and that's every shepherd's dream. He took them deep into the riches of God's word, and as deep as he could. And when he did that, he withheld nothing from them. There, There was no doctrine that he didn't leave them to try to figure out, that he didn't leave uncovered, but he rather explained with thoroughness and and a dedication. And then he leaves his protege, Timothy, his very own son in the faith, his disciple, his closest ally, if you will, who pastors the church from there. But by then, the Ephesian church had already compromised itself because it held an open mind toward worldly philosophy and errant truth. Ephesians chapter 4 describes them as having gone wayward, being tossed to and fro and carried about by waves and every wind of doctrine. They became infatuated with theological novelty They were like a ship in a rocky harbor with no anchor. And that happened first because it compromised the integrity of its leadership. When Paul left Ephesus for the final time, he gave a stern charge to the overseers that there would be false teachers, wolves dressed in sheep's clothing, 
what that meant was that was not that they would be uh, individuals who come into the church and put on as though they were a sheep, but rather a, a wolf dressed in sheep's clothing or a false teacher dressed in sheep's clothing. That was the sign of a prophet. That was the sign of a true man of God. That was a that was a sign in the first century church of a of a shepherd. And there would be wolves in sheep's clothing, masking themselves as true shepherds of the church who would come and wreak havoc in the flock, steal away sheep to their own destruction. They didn't heed Paul's warning and compromise the integrity of its leadership. And we've repeatedly seen the premium that the New Testament places on godly leadership. Ever since the fall of man, in fact, the world has been in this endless pursuit for righteous leadership. The world has been in conflict. The world has been at war. Civilians have been abused, taken advantage of, manipulated, extorted, stolen from, and all the rest due in large part because of bad leadership. The history of Israel is a history of bad leadership with brief, very brief windows of grace because of a good king who feared God and led the nation to repent. And consequently, ever since the fall, the world has been in this endless pursuit to find some way to secure honest leaders, leaders that are honest, uh, leaders that are protective, leaders that are don't act out of self-interest, leaders that have integrity. At every level of society, institutions and laws exist to protect civilians, protect the workforce from bad leaders, bad politicians, bad kings, bad rulers, bad employers, in every other level of leadership that we can conceive of in society, there are laws in place in the attempt to protect people from bad leadership. And yet, bad leadership continues to reign. And the church is no different. It's a sad reality that the church hasn't been spared bad leadership, but God has established in His Word how to protect the church of God from bad leadership. By laying out the character qualifications for the overseer. But that was where the breakdown began. A lack of commitment to the qualifications for the overseer instead of heaping up our own qualifications and how we would sift out the kind of leadership that we want rather than the kind of leadership that God wants. And certainly in Ephesus, this is where the breakdown began. And consequently... The church in Ephesus had become plagued with all kinds of problems, and so it had to be Timothy's responsibility to ensure the integrity of the church's leadership. This is why Paul appointed Timothy to continue to serve there and the integrity of its servants. Timothy had to ensure, and that's where Paul began in 1 Timothy, of course, chapter 1, putting out the false teachers, putting out the bad leadership, the disqualified leadership, reinforcing what biblical qualifications look like and biblical servants look like, And that was the first four chapters covering that. But here in chapter 5, we now see the church's responsibility to certain individual groups in the church. The first individual group we saw in verses 1 to 16, the church's duty to women who have been faithful and loyal to the church, who are left destitute and deserted, being all alone, bereft of a husband husband and bereft of children and grandchildren who would take care of them and provide for her. And then we began to see last time the church's duties to its elders, These are God-honoring commitments that it must make to the leadership that God has put in charge over them. This is a blessing to them, and this is a blessing to Him. And the language that Paul uses is very helpful because you remember that that Paul gets right to the very heart issue behind each of these priorities that he lays out for us. They can't be legalistically prescribed, in other words, because it has to be born out of the heart. And so what that means is that a church's commitments to these priorities are proof of its maturity, proof of its love for Christ, proof of its love for its leadership, 
and proof of its love for its own body. And we looked at this first one, and that was to show abundant honor to them for the work. And uh, we went a little bit long, but I told my wife when I got home that I was absolutely determined not to make that message into a two-part series. And, uh, and I'll say I was a little bit relieved, too, when it was over. And then I got back to the office this week, and Robert says, hey, I think you need to do that again. And I thought he was kidding, and he wasn't kidding. He goes, uh, no, I mean it. You really never got around to verse 18 at all, and verse 18 is such an important part of the argument. You can't leave that out, and so after the service, you can ask Pastor Robert about verse 18. I'll let him preach it. No, I'm kidding. Robert's right, and there's a first time for everything, isn't there? I don't mind joking with you, brother. Well, verse 18 is an important part of the argument, and you remember we did look at it briefly a few months ago on a Sunday night when we were in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, but for those of you who weren't here, 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 18 explains why it is honoring to God that the church gives proportionate honor according to the effort of his work, or proportionate pay according to the effort of his work. You remember by the time of the New Testament, the word teme, that is translated honor here, it came to be understood as a synonym for pay, and we saw numerous examples in the New Testament where we saw that very thing, where that was the case. But the word also carried it with it the idea of justice, what was fair, what was deserved. And in fact, those had come to be appropriate translations for the word to may as well, because it carried all of those ideas, along with the understanding that it would refer to financial remuneration of some kind. And the way we see this concept reinforced here in 1 Timothy chapter 5 comes in verse 17. This whole notion of providing fair compensation, earned compensation by the laborer. Verse 17 just to remind you, we've, we read the elders who rule well are to be considered. And, and here it is. The elders who rule well are to be considered what? What's the next word? Next word is worthy. Worthy. Worthy of double honor. Okay? So the word worthy means it's suitable also means what is deserved. This is what is deserved. This is fair to him. Oxiao, it means deserving. And now the reason is because he's qualified and he rules well, right? That's the reason that Paul provides us with. Everyone in this context, in the context of verse 17, is doing a good job. You need to understand that. Everyone who is Ruling here is ruling well. The elder who rules well is deserving of something. What is that something? That something is double honor. But there are some, we realize, who work extra hard at preaching and teaching. And again, all the elders are preaching and teaching. And certainly some in different capacities and in different ways than others. But this is a primary responsibility of the overseer. And so it's not even that... The preaching, teaching pastor gets double what the regular pastor gets. That's not what Paul is communicating to us at all. That's not the idea. And that's not, it's, it's not the quality of his work either because we've already identified these men as doing a good job. They rule well. I mean, so when you have a context of a church where all the overseers rule well, they're all doing a good job, they're all qualified, they're all teaching and preaching in whatever capacities that they have been called to in that particular church, what sets this man apart from the other overseers who also rule well and we're also teaching is simply his effort. How hard he works. He works hard. He goes beyond what's expected and that man is worthy of double honor. In other words, his pay should reflect his effort. So you can't be a socialist and say that you believe the Bible. Because obviously socialism would contradict 
the biblical reinforcement of the importance of fair compensation proportionate to the effort and quality of our work, and that's true for pastoral ministry, and Paul's whole argument in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 is that of course it's true in pastoral ministry because it's true in every other context of the workforce. And not only that, but it's also true in the context of even providing compensation for animals that labor in the field too. So for the minister of God, Paul asks an important question in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. He says, doesn't the minister have the right, doesn't the, the pastor, the shepherd, the teacher, preacher of the church have the right all the more than those who sow material things to reap honor for sowing spiritual things? And why is that the case? And that is the point of verse 18. Certainly, this is a matter of humility because it's submitting to the design of God. Just like everything else, contradicting it can signal a real point of false humility, even on the part of the preacher. To say that he is deserving of less when the scriptures say he is deserving of, or what he is deserving of is false humility. I'm not talking about refusing compensation or, or taking compensation, perhaps, of what is less than the Scripture says he is worthy or deserving of. He has the freedom to do that, remember? That is a matter of his Christian liberty. He has the freedom to do that. But even so, he still has to have a commitment to defend the right and to instruct the church in what is right. He can't call what God calls deserved undeserved. He can't call what God calls good evil. And Paul first quotes Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 4, the Deuteronomical law, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing. Doing that is cruel and unjust. And the point is, even the ox wants to reap some of the fruit of his labor, and you need to honor that. He, he has the right, because of his labor and the intensity of his work, to reap additional benefit from what you have called him to do, very simply. And if God cares that much for the ox, how much more so do you think that he's going to be concerned about his people being pro properly cared for? In fact, Paul makes exactly that point in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 9 to 11. He says, God is not concerned about oxen, is he? Or is he speaking altogether for our sake? Yes, for our sake it was written, because the plowman ought to plow in hope, and the thresher to thresh in hope of sharing the crops. If we sowed spiritual things in you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? If others share the right over you, do we not more? And, and this is a really good example, then, of how every ethic, every virtue, every moral good is a reflection on the character of God. Going back to the word honor and worthy that Paul uses, words that mean fair and deserved, what is God concerned about that's fair? Why is, why is God concerned about the ox? Because... These concerns reflect the character of God. That's why he's concerned about it. God is a righteous God, which means that he's concerned about what's right. God is, to use a synonym for righteous, just. He's a just God which means he's concerned about what he calls just treatment. And when he created man in his own image, he intended that that mankind would rule over his created order, over all the earth as his vice regents in a way that would reflect these just and right attributes. And though the fall has marred and corrupted the image of God and man that will not be restored until we receive our glorified bodies and rule over the new earth, 
certainly the redeemed church of God would still be very concerned that we would labor to restore God's original design. And that's why Paul quotes Jesus in his own words, who articulated the same concern for just pay, for righteous pay, in, in Luke chapter 10, verse 7, in the context there of a servant. The laborer, Jesus said, is worthy of his wages. So the same word worthy that we find in verse 17, again, it means deserving. This is what he is deserving of. The laborer is deserving of wages. And that's why you also remember we said that this isn't a gift. This isn't a gift. A gift is something that is undeserved, right? Something that's undeserved. But this is what he has earned because of his labor. And Paul moves from the lesser to the greater here, from ox to the servant, and insists that the ox be paid, all the more that the servant be paid. And just as it is entirely unjust, unfair, and unloving to muzzle the ox, it is also all the more unjust, unfair, and loving to refuse to pay a hired servant. And so the church has to realize that this is its responsibility. It is its joy. It is its justice, its righteousness to provide proper honor. And Paul squares this up as nothing less than a heart issue consistent with the spirit of generosity that Paul calls us to. Show them abundant honor. That was the first priority. That was the first responsibility the church must make. As self-serving as that may sound, that it's simply a matter of humility to submit to the text. And to continue to work and labor in the text as we proceed verse by verse through this letter. And then secondly, now we can look at verse 19 and the second responsibility or commitment that the church must make to its shepherds as well. This is also going to be a fruit, a byproduct of its honor, This is going to come from a heart of generosity or to use a a synonym of generosity to grace. This is going to be the gracious spirit of the church manifested in a different way. And that is to show show them loyal protection. In this verse, Paul writes, Do not receive an accusation against an elder except on the basis of two or three witnesses. Show them loyal protection. We know that recent events, both in the true and false church, have reminded us yet again the importance of purity in the pulpit. It goes without saying that the worst criticism the church or anyone in the church can receive from the world is that they are nothing but a bunch of hypocrites. And in instances where churches tolerate sin and refuse to discipline its members, and above all, where churches overlook and excuse or cover up disqualifying sins of its leadership, that accusation is entirely justified. At the point where we are willing to overlook disqualifying sin because of what that overseer might allegedly bring to the table, as it were, because of his charisma, because of his leadership prowess, because of his entrepreneurial um, business-like approach to church growth, and the church seems to be bursting at its seams and has grown so much under the leadership in his ministry. And so we'll, we'll push those things away, sweep them under the carpet. There's no question. Such a church is filled with hypocrisy. Just within the last 10 days or so, a whole mess of accusations of sexual impropriety came out against Bill Hybels, uh, who's known as the father of the seeker-sensitive movement and pastor of Willow Creek. And because of a long history of moral compromise and the weight of the evidence against him, he's in no position to defend himself against those accusations. Even though he continues to deny them and 
chalks all the evidence up as circumstantial lack of wisdom issues, such as living with his secretary, who was just a few years younger than him, going into the hotel rooms of women on his staff, throughout the entire context of his ministry. And I don't need to get any more graphic than that. But it was interesting. In an exact reversal of God, how God tells us we should respond to such a occasion. What's happening there is that the leadership that has any sense of integrity is resigning in order that Hybels can continue to remain in his position until he retires. I mean, just like they've got the purpose of the church backwards, they got this backwards too. And of course, there's no way that you could have missed the extremely indicting findings revealed this week by the Pennsylvania Grand Jury. The horrifying extent and long history of child abuse in the Roman Catholic Church in Pennsylvania. Over the last 70 years, just in our state, over 300 priests that we know of factually, that we have names of, have been involved in proven cases of sexually abusing more than a thousand children also that we know of. And many are saying that those numbers are actually in the multiple thousands. Now, I heard one priest being interviewed while condemning those actions, wanted his final word in that national interview to be a reminder that we're talking about a really comparatively small number here. And we're only talking about 300 out of approximately 15,000 priests. So out of all those priests, I mean, you're really, really only looking at 300 bad priests. But if you do the math, that's not such an exciting number. That's one in 50. And not only that, but the Roman Catholic Church was proved to be involved in a mass cover-up all the way to the cardinal level. But those scandals have always characterized the Roman Catholic Church, which is anything but the true church. And now is a good time, by the way, to distinguish between true and false Christianity because Roman Catholicism is not a reflection of true Christianity. But the world will see it that way unless you show them differently. And if you don't show them differently, they will assume Roman Catholicism's profession that they are the true church, true church of Jesus Christ. And what reproach do you believe that that would bring on his name? Roman Catholicism is not another denomination. It's a false religion. It's a cult. And so how does the true church handle scandal and sin in its leadership? Mass cover-up? Try to preserve any semblance of integrity, such as we've seen this last week in the Roman Catholic Church and its long history of that practice? Well, we'll get to that, but before we get to that, we have to look at the church's priority to protect its leadership from frivolous and false accusations first. And I say that because otherwise it might seem to be a little bit untimely to talk about why we must be committed to protecting leadership from false accusations, especially when we consider the extent to which we are to protect when we see all around us all these charges being brought against all these churches, true and false. Well, 
But the church must maintain loving loyalty to its leadership. And, and we have to go here before we can ever get to what we do when accusations against church leaders are substantiated. And the principle is this. We must have a dedication to predetermined innocence. Or to put it another way, we must prejudge innocence and be determined, determined to maintain that standard. So that's extremely important. And notice that I didn't say assumed innocence, such as in the American legal system, right? We are innocent until proven guilty. No, no, no. You assume proven innocent, proven innocent, declared innocent, judicially rendered innocent until proven guilty. That's how the economy of God is to work. That's the extent of your protection of the overseers of Christ's church. You must be determined to declare innocence unless certain criteria are met. That has to be your attitude toward accusations that are brought against leaders in the church. You must have a resolve in your minds at the very first accusation or charge being brought against your leaders that they are false charges and false accusations. There is no excuse for anything less than that very commitment. And no matter how many scandals plague the true or false church, that doesn't change your commitment to this priority. We don't change the commitment in in an attempt to woo the world system. Look, we are doing all these internal reviews because we want to sift out alleged accusations against our leaders accusations that are unsubstantiated. We want to do our, our due diligence. That's not how the church of Christ responds. There are occasions for receiving accusations, but that is not the first response. You must have resolved in your minds at the very first accusation or charge being brought against these men, that they are false charges and false accusations. There are a lot of ways that I could introduce the subject to you, but let's begin by asking the obvious question. If these are men who rule well, they are men who rule well, which means they are a blessing to the church because of their labor. It means they're qualified. It means they've already undergone the rigorous process of being sifted out. And it also means that they were put in place by other qualified leadership who've also been sifted out. And understand the full weight of Paul's words in verses 24 and 25 of 1 Timothy chapter 5. When he says the sins of some men are quite evident. In other words, they're readily visible to you. You can easily discern them. Them, going before them to judgment, but for others, their sins follow after. And in other words, sinful expressions might be more subtle, and, and those compromises and in integrity in the heart might have to be worked and drawn out. You need time to see them. Likewise, also deeds that are good are quite evident, and those which are otherwise cannot be concealed. No. Why does he say that? Well, because of what he says in verse 22. He says, Do not lay hands upon anyone too hastily, and thereby share the responsibility in the sins of others. Keep yourself free from sin. So qualified leadership is going to understand the importance of sifting through before the appointment of new qualified leadership because they become complicit in ordaining them to the task in their sinful conduct, in their moral failures. So these are men who have already been vetted. These are men who are qualified, and that means that they have the pleasure of God and have been appointed by God. They are honorable. They are above reproach, which is the first qualification. And how do you think people then are going to get rid of those who are above reproach? And you remember we looked at that word, and what, what we learned there was that means it, without accusation. You cannot bring an accusation with them because there's no accusations that will stick. How do you get rid of that kind of leadership? How is Satan going to kind of kind of get rid of that kind of leadership that God wants? 
Well, the testimony of Scripture is, is pretty consistent. Where he cannot capitalize on the spiritual weakness of an elder, he will capitalize on the spiritual weakness of the church. And allow false accusations to begin to take root. In other words, if he can't draw an overseer in, into some egregious, disqualifying sin, certainly that's what he's going to try to do. He'll fabricate and make up and use people to bring false charges and false accusations to have him removed. And do you think he really could care less which happens? I mean, as long as the man of God is removed as a shepherd of the church, right? As long as that level of protection for the church is vanquished, is terminated. I mean, that, that's certainly a part of his end. It doesn't really matter if the pastor is accused or actually commits some disqualifying sin. As long as people believe that he did, then certainly he's accomplished his purpose. I'll tell you something. Satan really couldn't care less whether you or I sin. The reason he wants you to is because of the reproach it brings on Christ. This, this whole warfare has nothing to do with you or me. Don't think too much of yourselves. This has everything to do with Christ. This has everything to do with the Father and the Holy Spirit. You are simply the vice regents. That's why Satan attacked Job. Because of the reproach it would bring on God. Who cares about Job? So he wants to bring reproach on Christ. And the closer the accusers are, the more effective their accusations will be, the more readily they will stick, even if they are unsubstantiated. The more hurtful they will be, the more reproach it'll bring. And so we need to understand that that is a primary tactic of the enemy, to bring false accusations against men of God leading his church, Christ's church. It's not by any means... That the overseer is above accusation. By no means am I above accusation. We're Robert or Greg or Tom. None of us are above accusation. But we would also be foolish to believe that there aren't always going to be instruments of Satan, even among ourselves, who will bring charges that they may even perceive to be true, but are not true. False accusations. And that's especially going to be the case where there is any kind of commitment to accountability and purity in the flock. You have to understand that anywhere that exists, anywhere that the word of Christ is taught with any sense of authority, anywhere the word of God is preached with any sense of conviction, there is always going to be a line of people ready to accuse the pastor or pastors of harsh and unjustified things. There's always a line of people eager to accuse him of all kinds of wrongdoing. And I'll tell you, that's why I'm never encouraged by what we refer to as uh, blessed subtraction sometimes. You've heard that term? Sometimes you get this individual in the church who's just a chore, right? Or maybe we would refer to them as blessed opportunities to minister to them, encourage them to grow in Christ. But you get this individual in the church who's just a constant problem. They're like a leech, and they just breed controversy, and, and conflict follows them wherever they go. And when they finally... Leave, everyone just breathes a sign of relief. Well, I am young, 
And I am early in my years of pastoral ministry. I know that, but I've already learned enough about pastoral ministry to know that that's not when I want to breathe a sigh of relief. That's when it's time to hold my breath. (laughs) Because better the devil you know, right? Better the instrument of Satan you know. It's naive for me to believe that there won't always be a thorn in the flesh. And I also know that for everyone that gives up, the next will always come from someone a little closer. The sense of betrayal will be more personal. The wound will be made more tender. It will run a little more deeply. If that instrument didn't work, the enemy will find one that will. And I know that that's going to be true because I know that there will always be occasions where I do offend someone, whether because I actually sinned against them in some way or maybe because I let them down or because they disagreed with me about something or because I missed a ministry opportunity or said something or handled something in some way they didn't like or so on and so forth. We could go on and on and on. Uh, Sometimes it might be because they didn't like something that was preached or the way that it was preached or the authority with which something was preached, and so they strike at the messenger who made them feel a sense of guilt. In other words, I might have offended someone because of something I did or because of something that they perceived that I did. Accusations don't generally come out of thin air. Sometimes they certainly do. But regardless, I'll never be able to shepherd the flock of God with perfection. And if the one who did shepherd the flock of his people with perfection was still murdered by his own people because of false accusations, what in the world makes me think that I would escape similar treatment? What in the world makes me think that at the time when a problem sheep leaves, that that would be the moment that we can all breathe a sigh of relief? And that is the blessed subtraction in our church, and that there won't be someone else. Someone else, you, you might even say, appointed by Satan to chastise the church. The perfect shepherd was completely sinless, yet he was called a sinner. The perfect shepherd was merciful, but he was accused of being a friend of tax collectors. The perfect shepherd always spoke the truth, but he was accused of being a liar. The perfect shepherd was sent from God, but he was said to be of Beelzebul. The perfect shepherd performed signs and miracles that validated his message, but he was condemned as a blasphemer. And given that being the sinner I am, I am completely worthy of any of those charges. I can't even imagine the kind of charges that could have been brought against me. And that can be brought against me. So when charges are brought against an elder, what is your duty? What is our response? What honors Christ? How are you supposed to respond? Certainly at this point, we have a high commitment to integrity. We get that. We're all there. We have a high commitment to integrity in our leadership, to qualified leadership. Does that mean that we take charges against an elder seriously? Well, yes, as a matter of fact, we do. When you accuse the overseer of ill motivation, of heavy handedness, of sin, of whatever else you might accuse him of, do we take those charges very seriously? We most definitely do. If someone brings an accusation against an elder, Husbands take accusations against an elder to their wives, or wives take an accusation against an elder to their husbands, complain, uh, gripe, and friend takes an accusation to a friend and complain and gripe, bring accusations. That is a very serious sin. 
very serious sin if there is no witness, no evidence to substantiate that claim. And, folks, that's what we take very seriously. If someone, anyone comes to you with an accusation based on their testimony alone, you need to confront that individual for acting sinfully, for sowing discord, for being factious. So again, we take it very seriously. Not perhaps in the way that you might expect, but we take it very seriously. It's a serious issue. And if you don't put an end to unsubstantiated accusations, no matter how authoritative or trustworthy that individual might be to you, you have the biblical duty to put an end to it. And if you don't, then you become complicit in that instrument of Satan to discredit Christ's church. You need to feel the weight of Paul's present imperative command here. I hope you're beginning to sense that. He says, do not receive an accusation against an elder. That's pretty straightforward. That's a strong command. Paradecamai. That means don't even acknowledge it. That's the command. Someone comes to you with an accusation, disgruntlement, or whatever the case may be, you don't even acknowledge it. Paradecamai. You ignore it. That is an imperative command. and We can respond with all kinds of what-ifs and hypothetical scenarios, but that doesn't change the command. You have the biblical duty to flatly reject the accusation. Because you love your overseers. This is grace to them. You're not even to entertain it. You're not even to give it an investigation. You don't sort out, is this true? I mean, that's a serious thing, if that's true of what that person said. You don't even open an investigation. You ignore it. And anything short of that is sinful. And and by the way, I have this same commitment to our elders. We have the same commitment to one another. And I'll just tell you up front, don't even bother coming to me with anything, any charge that you might have against any one of our letters unless you have some credible evidence to back it up or be ready for a very serious rebuke. Because this is a serious issue for the unity of the body. John MacArthur commented while I was out in California, If anyone comes to me bringing an accusation against another member of our elder board, they better have witnesses or they're going to be the ones looking for a job. This is a very serious issue. You know the expectation. You know the level of commitment and protection, the level of loyalty that you are to give to your God-appointed leadership. You need to understand that your shepherd is going to be crippled. He'll never be able to be the minister and to minister as a mouthpiece of God as effectively as he could if he didn't have a congregation committed to turning a deaf ear to accusations. He has to engage sin. He has to confront it and deal with it. That's what he's been called to do, and it's inevitable that accusations are going to be brought against him. You can't protect him from false accusations. Those will happen. You protect him by not even giving an ear to it and so lending credibility to those false accusations. You simply ignore them. You have to be ready to refuse those accusations. The Puritan writer John Trapp said that truth has always a scratched face. That's really good. One more reason why Christians shouldn't have cats, because I think that's what he's getting at there. (laughs) Cats do that. It speaks for the heart of man. Here's a man who's been called to confront sin and proclaim righteousness, but our instinctive response when he does that is to bat at his face with our claws out and turn and run before we even stop and meditate and consider is what he said just true. It's virtually instinctive. When we're confronted, we won't even listen. We won't even consider what's happening here. 
and we don't understand what's going on, and we just instinctively bat at his face and run, and maybe occasionally stop and turn to see what it was that we scratched at. You know, even Paul had to defend himself again and again in virtually every church that he ministered in because of false accusations that were being brought against him. Accusations marring his integrity. Accusations uh, accusing him of ill motivation. Accusing him of an impure heart. And that is consistently seen as a primary strategy of false teachers from the devil. Paul continues in verse 19, though, because it's, again, not that we don't ever receive any accusation against the elder, the overseer. We are not above accusation. That is not the issue. By no means is the overseer above accusation. In fact, we'll see next week the severe consequences if he is found to be in sin. And that assumes that an accusation was considered and was received, wasn't it? But your first commitment has to be to protect him. But pay close attention to what Paul says next. He says, but your first commitment has to be to protect him, but, but then remembering what the word receive means, the word receive means to entertain, to think about, and that's the same word that's carried over to the second half of verse 19. Do not receive, do not entertain an accusation against an elder except by two or three witnesses. So even here, the benefit of the doubt is given to the overseer. Several times in scriptures, we read that every fact is to be confirmed by the testimony of two or three witnesses. That's written in the Deuteronomical Law, twice, in fact, in chapter 17 and again in chapter 18. It was affirmed by our Lord repeatedly in John chapter 5. Jesus says, if I testify by myself, my testimony is not true. But the Father testifies about me, and so you know that my testimony is true. Again, in Matthew chapter 18, in the process of church discipline, Jesus gives us some words of comfort in the process of church discipline because in the second and third steps, you include a plurality of witnesses to confirm the unrepentant sin in someone's life. And Paul reaffirms the same thing in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. And then the importance of that is established again here. But even here in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 19, for the overseer, the mouth of two or three witnesses doesn't confirm the accusation as fact. It's just that at that point, the accusation is received. In other words, it's at this point that an investigation begins. But there's still an assumption of innocence even at this point. You receive the accusation when there are two or three witnesses. And by the way, evidence can be understood as a witness. And it's at that point that the investigation begins. There are always going to be people that are willing and eager to listen to lies, especially those who champion themselves as being defenders of the weak. We need to remember that. In fact, entire ministries exist for the sole purpose of giving individual professing believers a platform to bring unsubstantiated charges against their pastors because their church leadership wouldn't listen to them. And they follow their responsibility in how they're supposed to receive unsubstantiated charges. The elders did well. But the individual wasn't content with that, wasn't satisfied with that. So these ministries exist for such people to gain access to a public forum, to public rebuke their pastors and discredit them. And they get this platform, and then a whole host of people call that pastor to repent of something he didn't do, but was assumed to be true because a platform was given to someone who had an accusation without evidence. And that happens all the time. But the overseer of Christ's church cannot live at the mercy of frivolous, evil accusers who are nothing more than an instrument of Satan. They are not above accusation. When there are witnesses, when there is evidence, then investigation is opened, and that investigation might show the pastor is innocent or it might show that he is guilty. And when he is guilty, then we'll see how the church that loves its elders is supposed to respond to that as well next time. We are out of time today. I went a little bit over, and we started a little bit late. But nevertheless, I'm going to call an audible here. 
and um, we were supposed to close with hymn number 393, but in the interest of those who've been preparing our meals, and I know many of you have to pick up your children, we'll just close the service from here, and bow with me in a word of prayer, and we'll also pray for our meal, and um, I don't think David Gogler is here um, to give us any further instructions, I don't think so, but he's down there busy uh, getting ready for serving us, so we'll, we'll pray. Pray for our service this morning. We'll pray for our meal together. We invite you to join us. And once again, I would like to remind all of you that you certainly have um, the freedom to come and ask any of us about any questions that you might have pertaining to anything you heard this morning or about the gospel. We'll be all available to you for the majority of the afternoon and throughout the week. Let's close in prayer. Father, we do thank you, Lord, so much for this day that you've given to us. We thank you that the rain has held off and that we can enjoy this wonderful time that we look forward to each year and just extending our time together around, uh, around our meal. And um, Lord, we do pray. It is a hard thing sometimes. We are so eager and willing to, to give an ear to gossip. But Lord, we pray that our church would be a church that is marked by grace and love. And because it is a church that is marked by grace and love. We would hold fast to your truth, to what you teach us in your word. We would trust you in the leaders that you have appointed for our church, in your design for the church, and your process for ensuring integrity and moral uprightness among its leaders as well. Lord, we pray for those who are here this morning who know absolutely nothing of your grace, who know nothing of your standards, know nothing of your holiness. But Lord, they do know something of your patience because you have been patient with them. Lord, we pray that they would come to see their sin and realize, as we heard this morning in Trent's testimony, that you are a just and holy God and you demand righteousness from us. And therefore, they need to repent of their sin and turn to you and receive the righteousness of your son credited to us by grace through faith alone. And Lord, let that be our church's testimony. The time when all kinds of accusations are being brought against the church, the time when the name of Christ is continually being marred because of a lack of integrity in its leadership. Lord, we pray for ours. Pray for myself. Pray for the rest of our elders, their purity, their devotion to this flock, their devotion to the word, their devotion to you. Lord, we pray for your protection. Brought by this body. And Lord, as we go now to fellowship together, we pray that you would bless the food that we are about to eat to our bodies. And that we would enjoy one another's time and the unity that we have together in Christ. And we pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. You are dismissed.